All right, good evening, everyone. Let me just open up the, uh, the share screen. Okay. So um, I did this with sources, but also just some general notes and guidance for, um, uh, for the topic. Um, and the topic uh, is a topic that connects to the Parsha and the Parshios that we're in really, the last two Parshios and of course, uh, um, uh, Parsha Miket. So we have the Parshios which have one recurring theme throughout and that is the theme of dreams. The dreams that begin, of course, with Yaakov's dream, the latter dream, dreams of Yosef, the dreams of Sarah Mashkim, Sarah Ophim, and the dreams of Paro. So it really is, if you wanna find one theme that ties in all of those Parshios, is the theme of dreams. Before we talk about what I think to be the most important message and a profound message within those dreams, I want to give a little background uh, uh, to the Jewish approach, traditional approach, both in the Chazal and beyond to dreams. What is uh, the Jewish attitude towards dreams? People come to me all the time, they say to me, I have these uh, frightening dream. What am I supposed to do? I, I think some something is being told to me. Someone called me this week, in fact, and said to me that they were dreaming uh, about a uh, about a deceased uh, grandparent who was very upset about something, and uh, this was a grandparent for whom no one had said uh, no one had recited um, Kaddish and no one said Shiva, and they wanted to know what to do in that situation. So these things happen all the time. Dreams are certainly part of our lives. During the COVID era, we hear a lot about sort of COVID dreams, dreams that are um, that are that are more colorful and more. Uh, more powerful. And I don't know if any of you have had those experiences, but I certainly have had uh, some more interesting dreams in the last 10 months than I typically do. A rabbi of mine once said that if you don't have dreams, then you should ask, well, what's going on in your life? You should be dreaming, right? But the question is, the question is, what's the content of those dreams? And what are we supposed to learn from those dreams? Um, in the 14, in the, in the 13th century, uh, and the 14th century lived a Rishon um, by the name of Jacob of Marvej, Marvaj, uh, Yaakov Marvaj, and he was, um, he was, that's the town that he was from in France. And he wrote a series of responses called Shut Min Hashamayim, questions and answers from, uh, from heaven. If you give me one second. Um, the Shut Min Hashamayim uh, was a series of questions that were uh, written down by this Rishon, Rav Yaakov, and he wrote them down, he put them under his pillow, and he submitted them via uh, inquiry of dreams, a Sheila Shalom, Sheila Shalom rather. He asked questions to God via an angel, and in his dreams, he received a bunch of answers. And by the way, you would think like some exotic questions he's asking, when's the end of days? When's the Messiah coming, right? Why does my, uh, why does my mother-in-law hate me? He asked actually really important questions. Questions like, who do we paskin like by tefillin? Do we paskin like Rabbeinu Tam? Do we paskin like Rashi, right? Things that like, like technical halachic questions. That's really, really is the shut uh, mina shamayim. And we paskin in certain ways, uh, in a certain direction. Now he's quoted as a Rishon. The question is, is it authoritative? It's a big debate. Can you rely upon it? The introduction is done by Rav Ruven Margolios, a fascinating contemporary, a somewhat contemporary rabbi from last century. And Rav Ruven Margolios, who wrote the Margolios Hayam, one of, probably one of the most important svarim on Mesecha Sanhedrin, talks about in the introduction, the power of dreams, lahalacha, as well as things like Baskol, heavenly voices, ways in which God communicates to us. The big question we want to know is, can you listen to what you learn about in a dream? Does it have any impact on the halacha? And should it have any impact on the way we live our lives? Well, there's conflicting evidence in the Gemara. On the one hand, the Gemara, Brachos, and then Zayin Mabes, uh, as you see in front of you, Chamisha, Echad, Mishi, uh, Echad, Mishishim, uh, Elo, Elohein, Eish, Dvash. There are five things that are one-sixtieth. Eish, Dvash, Shabbos, Shina, uh, Shena, and Chalom. Fire, honey, um, Shabbos, sleep, and dreams. Eish echa meshishim legehenim. Fire is one sixtieth of Gehenim, of of purgatory of hell. Devash is echa meshishim leman. Honey is one sixtieth of how sweet the the dew the the man was. Shabbos is echa meshishim olam haba. We all know that one. It's mein olam haba. It's a piece of the world to come. Shena is echad meshishim lemisa. 
Shana, sleep, is one sixtieth death. And this is why when we're sleeping, partially dead, and we say in the morning, Elokai uh, Neshama, because God takes the soul, and the Svarim write that there's always a risk that the soul will get mixed up with another soul. The quarry of souls, as we're sleeping, and all the Neshamas are sort of hovering above the heads, that it's a miracle that every night, we, every morning, we wake up with the same Neshama, right? We wouldn't want to wake up with someone else's Neshama. It would be frightening. So, um, so it's one sixtieth death. And Chalom, a dream, is echad meshishim lenevua. It's one sixtieth prophecy. That's the way we see a dream. So the question is, uh, what do we do with this? The Gemara, the Gemara in Darim, the Chesem and Aleph tells us. And I see, I have the Gemara here on, on the bottom of the screen. Amar of Yosef, nidu bechalom tzarech yud bnei adam hatirlo. Let's say you're in the middle of a dream, and the people in your dream put you into excommunication. Right. Can't even can't even have any rest in your dreams, right? They're chasing you in life and they're chasing your dreams. So you get put into excommunication in your dreams. So what are you supposed to do? So the so the Gemara says you need ten people to be mat to you. Normally we need three to allow you out of, but we need ten, a group of ten, to undo an excommunication that came in the middle of a dream. We're not talking about a based in proclaim that the person's in Nidoi because they didn't pay. Uh, Pay, pay. They didn't come to the basin when they were summoned. They didn't give a get. We're talking about you had a dream. And in the dream, a bunch of people said, you are excommunicated. You have to listen to it. And you need to find 10 people in the real world to be mad to you. That's the impact of a dream. The Ran, Rabbeinu Nisim, was probably the most important commentator, Rishonim, on Meseches Nidarim, explains, Lefisha Efsher Shveshlichus Hamakom Nis Nade, Lefichach Tzarch Asar the reason why you need this is because it's possible that through the shlichus of Hashem, that through the messen messaging of God, you were excommunicated in a dream. God deemed it so that you would be excommunicated in your dream. That's why you need 10 people in the real world. Because a minion of 10 people, when you have a minion of 10 people, that constitutes a makam, a place through which there is a hashra'at hashchina, presence of God. That's why we dive on the minion. That's why when we say Kaddish, Kedusha, Baruch all these things, we lay we do Dvaram Shebhe Kedusha, matters of holiness with a minion. So the reason why you need 10 people to undo a dream that had, in which you were excommunicated, because that was the word of God speaking directly to you. Echa Meshishim Lenevua, 160th of prophecy. God speaks to us in our dreams. This is not just nonsense. On the other hand, that's one approach within the Gemara. The Gemara in Sanhedrin tells us, well, we'll get there in a moment. The rest, the, we'll get to, to, the, to the, the other statement in just a second. Let's say um, a parent leaves a child money in a Yerusha, a legacy behind and you don't know where it is. So you have a dream. And in the dream, your father appears to you and he says, I know that you miss me, but let's get to the cut to the chase. You're looking for the password, the pin code for the bank account. And he tells you what it is in the dream. So that's the modern day version. Father arrives and he says, you're looking for the money. It's in a box. I put it underneath the bottom drawer in the, um, in the armoire. If you open up that drawer, you'll find a huge box filled with cash. That's your Yerusha. So you go there, of course. What's the first thing you do when you have such a dream? Right? You don't push the snooze button. You run over to that drawer. You open it up and you look inside. And lo and behold, you open it up and there's the money. But your father didn't just say to you, there's money there. He said, it's found in that exact location. The Hain Shomaiser, Shani. You can't use that money. That money belongs to Hektish. That money belongs to, it's a Maiser Shani, and it has to be tithed. It's off limits. So, what do you do now? Now you have a real dilemma. So, what happens? So, the Gemara says, Maiser Amru. It happens. Someone had a dream. In his dream, his parents said, 
the money that I, I was supposed to give you Yerusha, I put it away. I forgot to tell you about it. It's sitting in the closet and he tells you exactly the shelf. And by the way, that money is off limits. It's my Shani. It doesn't belong to you. So, so if that happens and you find the money, you don't have to pay my Shani. It's your money. You can keep it. Why? Because the, the Gemara said that divrei chalomos lo malin velo moridin. Part I'm highlighting here. Words of dreams. They don't go up and they don't go down. I want you to pay careful attention to that expression. Lo malin velo moridin. It's a phrase that means they are irrelevant. Words of dreams. And the Gemara says further, and Brachos has a whole part on dream interpretation that we don't have a single dream that doesn't contain nonsense in it as well. Dreams have a lot of nonsense, right? So, for instance, right, uh, the inventor of the sewing machine, or under credit with his uh, singer, I think it is, right? Um, I think singer, whoever it was who invented the sewing machine, he was struggling as an inventor. How do I come up with a device that allows you the the the, the needle? to weave up and down over the garment. In order to do that, you actually need the hand has to, what, what, do you do, what do you do with the needle? You push it through and you take it with the other hand. So how does a machine do that? Right, that's a tough machine to develop. So he was struggling with this as an inventor. And the story goes is that he had a dream and he was being attacked by a bunch of needles, but the eye, the hole, the eye of the needle was on the side of his attackers, not on the top. So if you put it on the side, the machine has the ability to spin it around. And he came up with a solution. He woke up and he said, I know what to do. I had my dream and I, and he built the sewing machine. Right. So I don't know if it was Singer or the other one, but Singer got the credit for it. But some of whoever had the dream, that's what he saw. So he saw a solution in his dream, but there was another part of his dream. He was being attacked by giant needles. So that's not real. Right. So give Dreams are nonsense. They contain some nonsense in, in them. The Gemara points out that also, whatever you think about, your Yehura Diyom will influence your dreams. So if you if you dream about ice cream all day long, you think about ice cream all day long, you eat ice cream all day long, you're going to dream about ice cream at night. Or you're going to be up all night. But one of those two things, if you eat ice cream all day, you're going to have problems at night in some way, or shape, or form. But it doesn't mean that, oh, God sent you a message. No. You want to understand why you're thinking about such things? Well, you were you were dealing with it during the day, right? Anyone who has a dream that uh, you know you, you have you have some crazy dream, and all of a sudden there's this there's this beeping, mm, 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 and you're like escaping some like futuristic cell, prison cell, and the guards are coming. It's always the Nazis who are attacking you, right? And you're running away, and you're trying to dodge this, dodge the bolts, and the beep mm, mm, because the, the facility is going to explode anytime, any minute. And then you wake up, and it's really your alarm. You forgot to put it on the music dial and you put it for the beeping dial and that's all it was it was just an annoying sound in the background but you've incorporated that into your dreams we know that well give me another example we ya yaakov has uh, yaakov um wrestles with the angel according to the rambam ram paskins it wasn't an angel it wasn't a real person it was actually a dream so how does the rambam of um nachem rabinovich zatzal who passed away during the COVID period he asked a question in his Commentary on the Rambam. He wants to know how does Yaakov get injured if it's a dream? The dream, you don't get hurt. Is that very simple? It was a very realistic dream. And he's wrestling with a very realistic looking angel. It wasn't real. And you toss and you turn, you roll, and you and he probably turned over on his wallet or something, or his keys. I don't know. He hurt himself on, on, a, on a rock and his hip was injured. But the point is that that was a dream. So that's that's one interpretation. But but what emerges is that dreams contain a lot of nonsense that are just the products of what we really want. In that respect, it's not that you don't listen to them, but that they're trying to show you a nevua, a prophecy. But here's the secret: prophecy is something you really know inside. It's really your inner thoughts that it took your subconscious state to bring them out. It's like, it's an amazing gift. Every night we can go through this meditative process where you can see what's really on your heart. Practical advice for a scary dream. The Gemara Brachos tells us that if you have a scary dream, you should make the dream sweet in front of three people. That means that you, you appeal before a panel. There's actually in the back of the sitter, if you look, there's a little script. It looks like a, a script that we say for Hatara and Nadarim before Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. 
and you repeat it and you say, Bosaya had a dream, it's scary. Um, and, uh, and if you could please make the dream good. And they say your dream will be good and you're done. And basically what, what they're showing you is they're finding the good in your dream and they're, they're extracting the bad. They're taking all the scary parts out. We even have a principle of halacha that if you have a scary dream, you could fast that day. It's a very serious fast. Tan is chalom. If you fast that morning, you wake up, you could even fast on Shabbos. It's the only fast other than Yom Kippur that could take place on a Shabbos. In a week, we're going to have the only fast that could take place on a Friday, which is um, a Sarah Batavis. And I, I wrote about that in my weekly directory. You'll see that uh, tomorrow, but or tonight, whenever it goes out. But the point is that the only dream that is Docha Shabbos other than Yom Kippur is a dream, is, is the only um, fast day that's Docha Shabbos other than Yom Kippur is a, is a fast day established because of a bad dream. Because there are real things in there, but you have to know how to extract real things. There's also a lot of nonsense in dreams. The story that Rabbi Nachman tells, and here's the story, a man once dreamed, dreamed that there was a great treasure under a bridge in Vienna. So he traveled to Vienna and he stood near the bridge trying to figure out what to do. He didn't dare search for the treasure by day because of the many people who were there, right? So an officer passed by and asked, what are you doing standing here contemplating? And the man decided the best advice would be to tell the officer the whole story, ask for help, hoping the officer would share some of the treasure with him. He told the officer the entire story, and the officer replied, a Jew is concerned only with dreams. I also had a dream, and I also saw a treasure. It was in a small house under a cellar. In relating the dream, the officer accurately described the man's city and his house, every detail. The man rushes home. He digs under his cellar. This time he didn't tell the officer about it. And lo and behold, he finds the treasure underneath the floor panel in his own home. He said, now I know that I had a treasure all along, but in order to find it, I had to travel to Vienna. You have a dream at night. You see something that tells you something informative about your life, something sweet, something perhaps unsettling, something you have to work on as a person. You knew it all along. You just had to, had to maybe put down the distractions and go into that uh, REM state. And uh, so you can discover so you could discover really what it is that, that you knew all along. The treasure was really there all along. That's the koch of dreams. Of course, the parable is not just about that. It's also about a person who travels far in life, and leaves the derech, and then finds out the hard way that they already had all the gifts in the world. It was already at home. They didn't need to get it elsewhere. I want to come up to now the second part of this year, which is really uh, relates to the first part. It's not the halachic and uh, hashkafic implications of dreams, but rather... Dream interpretation, the science of dream interpretation, Freud 102, is the part they don't teach you. Rabbi Bono says there were 24 interpreters of dreams who, left, who lived in Jerusalem. I dreamt a dream, and I went to each of the 24 interpreters. And what? Each one told me was unique and different than the interpretation from the other one. All of them had something different to say. But they all happened. They all came true. To teach you the idea that all dreams follow the interpreter. The awesome burden that is uh, placed on the shoulders of a person who has to interpret another person's dreams, their job is to direct the other person's subconscious into a place of consciousness. Someone tells you something vague and you have to steer them and say, oh, I think what you're saying is this. That's a very big responsibility. Rabbi Rekhefet uh, talks about the role of a, in a cynical way, but it, uh, well, a, a conversation he once had with a, a Hasidish Rebbe, and he says, how dare you tell people what to do with their lives? And they give, ask you advice. Who are you that you know what's best for them? He said, I never tell people what to do. I'm a really good listener. And I tried to draw out what they want to do. So dream interpretation is the process by which you, by putting words in the, in the, in the, in the world, you are now giving shot to the subconscious and lending it credibility. But it was already there. So Yosef interprets Haro's dreams correctly in this week's parsha. 
my question is, where did this wonder kid learn to do such a such a magic charm? Where did he learn this from? So I said there are three parshas that deal with dreams. This is the final one. If you want to understand where he gains the koach to interpret dreams, skinny cows, the fat cows, the wheat, the bundle, where does he get this from? So what you have to do is you have to go back and to learn about Yosef's coming of age story. But it begins before that. It begins with Yaakov. Yaakov had a dream. The ladder was sitting on the ground, and the head of the ladder was reaching the heavens. And angels were ascending and descending the ladder. I just realized something mid sheer Do you remember that expression? Words of dreams. They don't go up and they don't go down. That means dreams contain nonsense. But a dream that would go up and down, right? Lichora contains a lot of truth. So whose dream had things that went up and down? The sewing machine, right? No, the, the dream about the ladder. Malachelokim olim the yard in bow. It's a powerful dream. In it, he sees the four, the Medrash says, the four Malchios that will be Meshabed, that will persecute the Jewish people throughout history. How they'll go up, they'll ascend, and they'll descend. And eventually, the Jewish people will reign supreme. They'll come out on top. The Baruch will stand on the ladder, and you'll be by the Makam Mikdash. But the whole thing is, he wakes up and he says, I was by, I was, I was by the Makam HaMikdash. I had no idea where I was. I was in a place of Kedusha, but I thought I was in Gullus. That's the power of a dream. So I had no idea what I was doing. So Yaakov, Yaakov is critical. Yaakov then turns to Yosef. Let's go to Yosef for a second. Yosef is the second one to have a dream. Yosef dreamt a dream and he told his brothers, what was the first dream? He dreamt a dream about we were gathering bundles in the field. And my bundle got up. And stood in the middle. Your bundles bow down to my bundle. Right? Your pile of money was not as big as my pile of money. So it bowed down to me. It's essentially what it was. It's a power play. But he has a dream about bundles of wheat. And then he has another dream. They say, oh, you're going to rule over us? The brothers are furious. They're jealous. You will rule over us. You'll see for know And they hated him because of his dreams and because of his words. They hated him because he dreamt about his dominance. And they hated him because he was arrogant. Two reasons they hated him. and Then he dreamt another dream. I had another dream. The sun, the moon, and 11 stars, they were bowing down to me. Now even Yaakov chimes in. Yaakov says, what are you saying, son? Of course, Yaakov's going to step in and he's going to stop this display of arrogance that's tearing his family apart, right? So you would do That's what any responsible parent would do. What is Yaakov's critique? He doesn't say a thing about the arrogance, about Divar, about, about his haughtiness, his supremacy. Instead, what's this dream? I'm going to bow to you. Your mother's going to bow to you. Your brothers, and Rashi says, your mother can't be in the dream. Your mom can't be in the dream because... Where was his mother? He was no longer alive. He's making technical points about a dream. It's like a grammar police. Hold on one second. You can't end the sentence with a participle. Like, what, what is going on there? Why is he pointing out at this juncture that technically his dream can't be true? Technically his dream can't be true. Just decapitated a Lego. Sorry. His dream can't be true. Why not? He asked me to decapitate it. 
Why can't it be true? Because your mother is not alive in the story, he says. Rachel passes, passes away. So if she's not alive, how can you dream better? It's not really, by the way, if you want to dream, maybe I'll bow down to you. Maybe your brother's bow down to you, but not mother. And to go and support this approach, he says nothing about the arrogance. He, it says, Vaviv shamar davar. He watches from afar as the as the machlokas is broiling and getting to a getting to a boiling point. And not only does he watch it from afar, he sends Yosef into the lion's den, towards Dotan, towards Shem to be killed or to be sent away by his brothers. Yaakov is aware of the hatred. He's 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 either oblivious to it to it or he thinks it's necessary for whatever reason. But nothing about the dreams bothers him. How do I know? He says nothing about the first dream. First dream had the same connotations as the second dream. The brothers are subservient to Yosef. Yosef is, is younger than them and he's haughty and he's lording it over them. But this doesn't bother Yaakov. It bothers the brothers, but it doesn't bother Yaakov. What bothers Yaakov? The technical point about the mother being included in the second dream. Yaakov likes dreams that are precise. And this one is just not real, realistic. Divrei chalomos lo malin moridin. Doesn't go up and down the ladder. It's not like my dream. It's not real. He doesn't like unrealistic dreams. So you want the answer to this question? You want to know what's going on here? So if you give me five more minutes, you're going to understand everything about these parshas. The end of the, of the parsha last week ended like the beginning of the parsha. Book ends. The parsha began with two dreams, and the parsha ended with two dreams. In the beginning of the parsha, Yosef was the purveyor of dreams, and in the end of the parsha, Yosef is the interpreter of dreams. In the beginning of the parsha, Yosef is criticized, panned heavily, and cast into excommunication. He is the person who dreams and gets excommunicated. And who are the people who have to redeem him? The ten people, but they're the ones that are persecuting him. In the end of the dream, Yosef, in the end of the Parsha last week, Yosef is redeemed. And he is not purveying dreams. He's not tantalizing others with fanciful tales. Instead, he is allowing other people to realize their own dreams. Right? He's not the public speaker. He's the mental health professional. Right? He's allowing other people to, to unload. It's a lot less glorious. But for Yosef, he is redeemed after that process. By the way, after the first set of dreams, it's interesting. I, I, I didn't think about this here, but someone he has a fancy coat. And then someone rips it away from him. And then before he can go to prison, once again, he has a coat and someone rips the coat off of him and he leaves the coat there. Right? Asia Potiphar takes the coat, rips it off him. He runs away again. That's for another discussion. You could think about that parallel. It's a very important one. The end of the parsha, Yosef interprets the dreams. We have the Sarah Mashkim and the Sarah Ophim in front of you right here. And the first one is, it says, Sarah Mashkim says, I dreamt a dream. And the Geth and the Fanai, there was a grapevine in front of me. I saw it on the grapevine. It's the prequel to, I heard on the grapevine. But the Geth and Shosh Sarigim, and the Geth, and there were three branches, Kaf, uh, Rachat, Olsa. It was, it was going up. Budding, and there was a bundle of grapes, a cluster of grapes. And the cup of paro was in my hand, and I took the grapes, and I pressed, I squeezed them into the cup, and I gave, gave the cup to paro. And Yosef said, oh, in three days, paro's going to lift you out of prison, and he'll put you back on your, on your perch, and you will be the butler for paro again. Your name will be Alfred. And then it says afterwards, well, this is a great idea. <laughs> Look how he interpreted, and that kachava, he was pulled out of prison. So the Sarah Ophim, so I also had a dream. And in my dream, because I stole right, I might find the three baskets of bread on my head, and the upper basket, I had Paro's food, and birds were packing away, right? Remember that? The Of, Ochelo Samina Sal Roshi. So Yosef said, ready, drum roll, he's all excited. It's in three days. It'll be three days, Paro's going to pull you out of prison, and he's going to hang you by your neck. It's a terrible interpretation. So he should have stopped there. He shouldn't have asked, because we said that all dreams follow the interpreter. 
You should have just stayed in prison because you don't know what's going to be. Anyway, I want to ask you a question. Has Yosef no? Everything we put together so far, it all builds up. It all adds up into one story. How does Yosef know? So the answer is given by the great parabolist. I don't even know if that's a word. The Magid of Dubno. Yaakov Kranz. People think he's just a storyteller and likes Mashalim. He, he had parables, of course. He was the master of parables. He once said, someone once asked him how, how his parables fit so perfectly uh, to the, whatever's going on in people's lives. And he said, he said, you think that there's a target and I'm, and I'm hitting the target perfectly. He says, I shoot the arrow and then I draw a target around it. That's what he said to explain his parables. First, I shoot the arrow and then I draw the bullseye around it. So, yeah, so he also has not just parables, he has great, great commentary, co commentary on the Chumash and Tanakh. So he explains that in the dream of the Sar Hamashkin, it was realistic. The whole dream makes sense. There's branches and there's squeezing grapes and then I'm pouring in a cup and I'm serving paro. There's nothing that can't be realistic in that dream. It, it, it's, it, it's perfectly feasible. But in the dream of the Sar Ha'ofim, there's something that doesn't quite make sense. Where was the nonsense? Where was the lo ma'alin velo moridin in the dream of the Sar Ha'ofim? Where was the bit of nonsense? So he said that one time there was a king. Here's the parable. One time there was a king. And the king had a big festival. And he said, whoever draws the greatest picture, the most realistic picture, best picture, he will become my personal artist, the personal artist of the king. So they went around and they're awarding different, uh, different ribbons on each of the, you know, honorable mention. And they're each getting different, different badges. There's this one painting that's amazing. Everyone knows is going to win, right? It's like you ever go to like a, you know, like a fifth grade, um, you know, uh, art project and dioramas are all there and the kid with tin foil balls that lines up as the planets, right? And then you have like the other one. And then this this one kid comes up with something that you know he didn't do it. You know that his mother stayed up all night and she's like, she's got like, you know, like 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 three art degrees and things like that. And the kid brings this, this thing. <laughs> it's ridiculous, right? And everyone's like, come on, give me a break. So as that guy shows up to the art competition and everybody knows he's going to win, it's a shoe in And you're looking at this incredible painting of a man holding a basket of bread and it's so real it's so real that the birds are fooled and the birds are pecking away bread because they think the bread is real you know what the problem is king does not award him the prize instead it goes to the person with tinfoil balls because if it was real if the person looked real Birds wouldn't go near him, right? If the man was realistic, the birds would not go near him. So the bread was real, but that, that man was a dead man walking. He was a ghost, a shadow, a zombie. And so now you understand Yosef saw something in the dream that didn't quite make sense. The Sarah Ophim has a dream that he's serving the king, only there are birds pecking away at the bread. Guess what, says Yosef, you're not in that dream. You're a dead man. Okay, so now we understand the koach of interpretation, the secret of interpretation. Latch onto what's real, discard the rest. That's why the Gemara says some dreams have real elements, some dreams have fake elements. And you have to take the real and discard the fake. And there's a lot of nonsense that ends up in dreams, like an army of giant needles with holes in the side of their head. And take the take what's authentic, and a real interpretation interpreter of dreams, a real, a real baal hachalamos, is one who is above the bias and the nonsense, and is able to zero in on what a person really wants. Baal Eitzah said this Chassid Rabbi Rabbi Rakefet, someone who listens carefully, 
and understands what a person's really asking. He talks to their heart. Because he knows that that's what they're saying anyway. It's not a mo face, not a wonder. Let's go back to understand where does Yosef learn this? What was the dream of Yaakov? Yosef is told by his father. You want to dream about your ascendancy, ascendancy to greatness and being the most powerful Jew of all? Fine. It's all possible. Someone has to be great and mighty. Might as well be you, Yosef. I encourage you. Go. Pursue your dreams. And be realistic. Right? Be realistic. Don't think that you could bring back your mother from the dead. That's only in the hands of God. Now, why is he getting all technical on him? Because as a father, he wants his child to imagine and to wonder and to accomplish great things and to interpret what's on his heart. But never do it from a place of being inauthentic and unrealistic. Because if you do that, you'll never achieve anything. So he makes a technical point. I too had dreams once. I dreamt about a ladder. And that ladder was unique. Rosho Magia Shamayama. The head of the ladder reached the heavens. Shoot for the stars. He encourages him to do that. Aval Sulam Mutsav Artsa. The ladder has to be firmly planted on the ground. Be grounded. Be realistic. You want to make millions? Fine. Come up with a plan. Dream big. But also be realistic. And now Yosef is grounded. He's grounded by his experiences, by his trauma, by rejection. And he comes back. He reemerges onto the scene after, be, after going through a miserable lawsuit. Right? And he builds his business back up again. But this time, the chachma, the wisdom. I'm going to find real dreams, but I'm going to show them what works and what doesn't. Yes, you will accomplish great things, Paro. But recognize that there will be a downfall of your economy as well. So use the miraculous time to build up your industry, to build up your storehouses. Use the seven years of plenty. Be realistic and plan for the future. And recognize that setbacks are part of life as well. You can't bring back the dead and you can't circumvent a pandemic and you can't survive things that are beyond your capability. Dream big, be realistic. And that's why Yosef is great. If you know anyone who teaches the students, their children, their friends and themselves how to find, how to not lose hope and not lose sight of, of your dreams, but to stay grounded in reality, that person will be a leader of men. I'll share with you one story about one such person. Great Rabbi Nassim Tzvi Finkel of blessed memory, who was the Rosh Yeshiva, the Mir Yeshiva, who built up the largest and most, prestige, and most prestigious yeshiva in the world. And by prestigious, I mean that Bate Midrash is all over the place and that if you want to get a shidduch, you have to at least go there for one day, put it on your resume. In the yeshiva world, I didn't go there. I walked through there one day and I stopped at the bakery instead, Angel, and I got a nice warm mareka. That was my day in the Mir Yeshiva. Anyway. Rav Nassim Sifinkel, and this story was told by Rabbi Frand at the previous Sima Shas, now eight, eight and a half years ago. He said that um, there was, a, he was talking about the importance of having a vision, having a, a plan in your Limud HaTorah, a plan in your growth, in your spiritual growth. You, know, you can't just say, okay, I'll jump into a shear when I have time. I'll dive in when I have time. I'll, I'll work on my midos when, 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 when things aren't bothering me, when everyone else is not a jerk. So you can't, that doesn't work. You need, you need a plan if you're going to succeed. So he told this, he, he spoke about having a plan. And there was an older gentleman who was retired. He was 70 years old. And he said, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to, um, I'd like to learn more. So he's, uh, I'd like to study shots. This is, this is great. You need a plan. Go home and come up with a plan. So he comes back. And he says to Rav Nelson Sifinkel, I calculated everything and with my pace, my level of learning and my abilities, I realized that maybe he was like 60 something, seven years old. When I'm 93, I can finish Shas. 23 years it will take me. 
and he, he went through the plan. This number of hours a day, right? Making time for other things, family, other engagements, mishaps. 23 years, I think I could, based on this schedule, and he wrote down a whole Rashima. And Rav Nassim Sifinko was excited and animated suddenly, even though he was really a sickly, elderly man. He said, oh, that's a plan. That's inspiring. That's a dream. But then, then he said, but I'm getting older and each year is going to be harder. My cognitive ability will surely decline. And who knows if I could even achieve it. Realize, tempered by reality. You dream big, but you have to be realistic. And Nassim Sifinko countered Yosef's wisdom for a moment in time. And he was struggling and he was shaking with advanced Parkinson's and his hand was shaking mightily and he reached under the, 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 the mat that was on his desk or in a drawer and he pulled out after like great painstaking effort a piece of paper and it was folded up into eighths and he unfolded it and he unfolded it again and unfolded it again. And this is a man who had built up the Mir Shiva three, you know, hundreds of times bigger than it was when it, when it first came to his hands by the Chicago native, went to Mosheva. And Rav Nassim Finkel, formerly Nate Finkel, who played basketball in the Idaho Crown Jewish Academy, opened up the piece of paper. And he showed him, he said, and here, and he was maybe the last few years of his life, and here is my plan for the next stage in the expansion of the Mir Yeshiva. Look at me. Do you think that I can do this? And he was in tears. He slammed it down on the table. You have to establish a plan. You have to have a dream. You have to write it down. Be aware that there are challenges. But always shoot for the stars. There's nothing that is not beyond you, beyond your ability. A dream is just interpreting whatever you want to vision during the day, but you're too much of a coward to do so. So you wait until the night when no one else can make you feel bad about it. And you have to make it reality during the day. That's why there's such weightiness to dreams. And with that, hopefully we've, I've inspired myself to do something good with my life. Uh, we will go. I wish everybody a wonderful uh, evening and a beautiful Shabbos. And uh, as we watch the world burn out, that your Hanukkah should be filled with light. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rabbi Gaman. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.